Welcome to our webinar series, Non-Invasive Prenatal Testing, Background Science and Clinical Implementation. Module 2 begins with a review of screening terminology, followed by a brief overview of any employee testing options. After viewing this webinar, you should have a basic understanding of screening terminology, including sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values, as well as an awareness of available testing options. Before discussing current prenatal and employee testing options, it is important to review general screening terminology. An ideal screening test would be a test that is reasonably priced and easy to administer with very little discomfort to the patient. It should identify a common disease that is clinically significant where early detection or treatment could impact outcome. The screening procedure itself does not diagnose the illness. However, those who have a positive result from the screening test will need further evaluation with subsequent diagnostic tests or procedures. Lastly, an ideal screening test must also be sensitive and specific. In other words, a test that can correctly identify patients where the disease is present, sensitivity, and correctly identifies patients where it is not present, specificity. Now let's talk a little bit more about sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity and specificity are important performance statistics for any test. Sensitivity is the portion of individuals with a disease or condition who have a positive test, and this is also known as the test detection. This can be calculated by dividing true positive by the total number of individuals with a disease or a condition. Specificity is the portion of individuals without a disease that will have a negative result. This can be calculated by dividing the total number of true negatives by the total number of individuals without the disease. If you subtract a test sensitivity from 100%, that would equal the percent of false negatives. And if you subtract a test specificity from 100%, that would equal the percent of false positives. Here's an easier way to look at sensitivity and specificity. Many of you have probably seen a chart similar to this in the past, and it can be very helpful in understanding the calculations more clearly. The two columns are the number of patients with a disease and the number of patients without a disease. The two rows relate to the results of the test, with the top row being the total number who tested positive and the bottom the total number that tested negative. To determine the sensitivity, you would divide the number of true positives by the number of true positives with disease plus the number of false negatives, or the total number of individuals with a disease. To determine specificity, you would divide the number of true negatives by the number of true negatives with the disease plus the number of false positives, or the total number of individuals without a disease. Positive predictive value, or PPV, and negative predictive value, or NPV, are two additional important terms used when discussing a screening test. Often predictive values are confused with sensitivity and specificity. But what is important to keep in mind is that PPV and NPV calculations rely on individual test specificity and sensitivity, as well as an accurate disease prevalence, the latter of which can vary from patient to patient. In particular, each patient who undergoes a pregnancy screen will have a different baseline or a priori risk for aneuploidy. A PPV is the probability of a disease or condition given a positive test result. In other words, if a test is positive for a condition, what is the chance that the patient is actually affected? NPV is the probability of the absence of a condition or a disease given a negative result. In other words, if a test is negative, what is the likelihood that it is a true negative? Why should we care about predictive values? Well, NPV and PPV are two of the most important measures of a test and are important factors to discuss during both a pre-test and post-test counseling session as they help patients determine a much more individualized risk assessment. So let's look at the same table but follow the rows across. This will allow us to calculate our PPV and NPV. A PPV is the number of true positives or patients with a positive result who have the disease over the total number of patients with a positive result. The NPV is the number of true negatives 
over the total number of patients with a negative result. Now that we've reviewed basic statistical terminology as it pertains to our current screening tests, let's review the different aneuploidy screening and testing options that are currently available to patients. There are many options available in a pregnancy for the detection of aneuploidy, and most are dependent on gestational age. Tests can be a combination of a blood sample with or without ultrasound and or invasive diagnostic testing. Physicians choose which tests to offer their patients based on various factors, such as clinical guidelines or a patient's pregnancy or family history. We know from various publications that prenatal testing uptake varies geographically, and not just from country to country, but also from region to region. There are non-invasive options and invasive options in both the first and second trimesters. However, as you can see from this table, options in the third trimester are quite limited. In particular, serum screening is not available after 22 weeks gestation. When a serum screen is performed during pregnancy, what does it screen for? Screening results offer an estimation of risk. Current serum screening options can provide risk for Down syndrome, trisomy 18, and in some cases trisomy 13, as well as risk for open neural tube defects. The risk cough level is predetermined and is generally based on an individual laboratory's testing validation. These cutoffs tend to be similar between labs, but they may vary slightly. Assessment of risk for chromosomal abnormalities is based on biochemical markers in the blood, maternal age, and some additional clinical factors that we will address on the next slide. In some cases, an ultrasound measurement may also be factored in. Results are presented as risk scores and take into account population statistics. A positive test result for a particular condition means that the risk for the fetus to have that condition is at or above a chosen cutoff level. For example, if the screening cutoff is 1 in 250 and a patient's risk is greater than 1 in 250 from the screen, her result is then labeled as positive. A positive result is often misinterpreted to mean that the fetus is affected. A negative or low risk result means that the patient's risk is below that chosen cutoff. Again, oftentimes it may be misinterpreted to mean that the fetus is normal or unaffected for that particular condition. Ultimately, the only way to confirm the presence or absence of the condition is by having a diagnostic procedure. In general, the false positive rate is set at 5% for serum screening. This slide shows us the different factors that may be taken into account during the risk calculation for traditional serum screening. The factors on the left are biochemical markers in the blood that can be measured in either the first or second trimester, depending on the screen. The factors on the right are patient-related factors, such as ethnicity, maternal weight, and gestational age, which are also part of the calculation. As we know, measurements may vary between different laboratories. In addition, a risk score can change significantly, even with a small difference in any of these additional factors. A patient may have multiple ultrasounds throughout the pregnancy. Many patients have a first trimester ultrasound, usually between 11 and 14 weeks gestation. Additional screening options include measuring the amount of fluid in the soft tissue in the back of the fetus's neck, which is called a nuchal translucency, or NT. This NT measurement may be increased in fetuses affected with aneuploidy, such as trisomy 13, trisomy 18, trisomy 21, or monosomy X. In addition, the nuchal translucency can be increased in fetuses affected with other anomalies, such as other genetic conditions or isolated congenital defects, for example, a congenital heart defect. A full anatomy assessment typically occurs in the second trimester around 20 weeks gestation and is also known as the genetic sonogram. The genetic sonogram is used to assess the fetal anatomy and look for structural anomalies such as heart defects, brain anomalies, or soft markers. Soft markers may include an echogenic or bright valve or a shortened femur bone. These soft markers are not birth defects. However, when present, they can increase the likelihood that aneuploidy is present and are considered to be one type of screening. 
The next two slides show the region of overlap that we see with current aneuploidy screening options. This illustrates how prenatal screening can lead to either a false positive or false negative result. The graph is an example of this triple marker screen, which has performed between 15 and 21 weeks gestation. The vertical line is the abnormal cutoff value established by each individual lab. In this case, the vertical line represents a Down syndrome risk of 1 in 270. On the left side of the vertical line is the distribution curve for a Down syndrome risk in a patient with a pregnancy without Down syndrome. On the right is the distribution curve for Down syndrome risk in patients with a pregnancy that is affected with Down syndrome. Given that these screens are set up based on a false positive rate of 5%, which is this small overlap area on the right, it leaves a 30% false negative rate, which is the small overlap area on the left. So in other words, there will be patients who have an affected pregnancy that have a risk that falls below the 1 in 270 cutoff, and those are the false negative cases. And there may be patients without an affected pregnancy that have a risk that falls above the 1 1 in 270 cutoff, and those would be the cases of a false positive. This is the same type of slide showing the overlap areas for a test with a better sensitivity, such as the first trimester screen. As you can see, we continue to make improvements to the rate of false negative results. What we want to do is continue to improve on the separation of these curves to decrease both false positive and false negative. This is a list of the conventional non-invasive prenatal screening options from the updated ACOG practice bulletin from 2016. As you can see, the detection rate for trisomy 21, or Down syndrome, ranges from 64 to 96% at a false positive rate of approximately 5%. These rates are even lower for trisomy 18. Rates can be improved with a combination of these procedures at multiple stages in the pregnancy. For example, integrated screening involves a blood draw and an ultrasound in the first trimester, followed by a blood draw between 15 and 20 weeks, at which time the result is reported. Although the detection rate is approximately 96% for integrated screening, the patient has to wait several weeks from the time of the first blood draw before obtaining their final risk result. We've talked a lot about screening options, such as first and second trimester screening and ultrasound. However, it is also important to review diagnostic testing options that are currently available. Chorionic villus sampling, or CVS, and amniocentesis are the two methods clinically available that can diagnose chromosomal abnormalities. Fetal cells are evaluated for chromosomal abnormalities using karyotype analysis or FISH analysis fluorescent in situ hybridization. Diagnostic procedures are associated with a risk to the patient and fetus, including infection, leakage of fluid, or even miscarriage, although these risks are very low. Generally, both an amniocentesis and CVS are considered the gold standard for prenatal diagnosis. It is important to remind everyone that even the gold standard is not 100% sensitive or specific. This means that false positive and false negative results, although not common, can occur with either a CVS or an amniocentesis. In an effort to improve upon the sensitivity and specificity associated with traditional screening options and avoid the risks associated with diagnostic procedures, an alternative option was developed that could bring the best of both of these options together. This alternative option is non-invasive prenatal testing and it utilizes cell-free DNA. Cell-free DNA is released from cells as they go through routine cell death or apoptosis. During apoptosis, DNA from the nucleus is cleaved into small fragments, approximately 150 to 200 base pairs in length. These fragmented molecules are released into the bloodstream as cell-free DNA. During pregnancy, cells from the placenta also undergo apoptosis and release cell-free DNA into the maternal bloodstream. Therefore, maternal blood during pregnancy contains both fetal and maternal cell-free DNA. 
So what makes cell-free DNA such an ideal candidate to be used for NIPT? Fetal cell-free DNA is much more abundant than fetal cells, and it is reliably detected after approximately seven weeks gestation. Cell-free DNA has a relatively short half-life, which means that it is undetectable in maternal circulation within hours postpartum. Therefore, future pregnancies are not impacted by the cell-free DNA from a prior pregnancy. As you may see in the literature, several different names have been used to describe cell-free DNA analysis. These include NIPD, or non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, NIPS, non-invasive prenatal screening, CFDNA, cell-free DNA, or CFS DNA, cell-free fetal DNA. You will see that most of these are used within the literature. However, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, or ACMG, recommends the use of NIPS. Based on what we know about traditional aneuploidy screening and diagnostic testing options, what are the ultimate goals for NIPT? The first goal would be to reduce the exposure of risk to the fetus that may be associated with procedures like a CVS or amniocentesis. We also hope to reduce the rate of false positives, but we want to do this by maintaining a high detection rate. And lastly, we want to make this a test that can be provided very easily to all pregnant women. The last topic we will cover in this module are examples for statistical calculations. Using the performance terms we discussed in the beginning with the various testing options available for aneuploidy screening, we will calculate sensitivity and specificity as well as positive and negative predictive values to determine differences between the options. This is an example of performance statistics for a screening test with an 85% sensitivity and a 5% false positive rate, or 95% specificity. The prevalence of Down syndrome in this calculation is 0.1%, or 1 in 1,000. Based on what we discussed earlier, the positive predictive value is the total number of true positives over the total number of patients with a positive result. For this patient, her positive result means the likelihood that the pregnancy is affected is 1.7%. Let's compare that PPV calculation to a PPV calculation for the same patient if she opted NIPT. As you can see, the sensitivity and specificity are higher for NIPT compared to the serum screening that the patient had in the last slide. Using a sensitivity and specificity of 99% each, with the same prevalence as the previous slide, the PPV in this case would be 9%. Here is a second PPV calculation for a patient who has had NIPT. However, in this case, the prevalence of Down syndrome is greater for her individual calculation. And this could be due to the fact that her baseline risk is greater as a result of her increased maternal age. Using the same performance data and the same calculation with a prevalence of 5%, the PPV for this patient is 83.2%. This demonstrates that prevalence of a condition is an important factor in the PPV calculation. Therefore, it is difficult to take a screening test, such as non-invasive prenatal testing, and extrapolate PPV and NPV values to an entire screening population. This concludes the second module of non-invasive prenatal testing, background, science, and clinical implementation. Thank you.